Uh, I'm Saeed Chaudhary. I work in the Sheridan Libraries at Johns Hopkins, uh, and I'm joined here by Yap uh, Yeratz, I hope I got that right, uh, who is a research associate at the Center for Editing Lives and Letters at the University College London. And we are both involved in a project called the Archaeology of Reading uh, that we'd like to talk to you about today. The principal investigator for this is Earl Havens, uh, who is one of my colleagues in the Sheridan Libraries. And we have two of the world's preeminent scholars who are the leads for this project, Tony Grafton at uh, Princeton University and Lisa Jardine uh, from the University of College of London who sadly uh, has recently passed away but was a very influential part of uh, conceptualizing and moving this project forward. We're going to take a slightly different uh, approach. So I think sometimes when you hear these project updates, what you basically see is the end result. You see some sort of website, some sort of interface that shows what's happened. And we do have that. We can, we can show you that at the end in the Q&A if you wish. But we're taking a different approach of trying to show you how we got to where we are today. Uh, and so that's why we're taking that name of the archaeology of reading, which is really a study of the history of the reading practices and so on, and thinking about the archaeology of how we built the infrastructure that supports this particular project. And I use infrastructure with a small I because we're not building something that's national or global uh, in scale per se, but rather something at a project and an institutional level. But we think that's part of a bigger picture, part of a broader network uh, of, of infrastructure and connectivity. If you heard Cliff's remarks earlier today, if you attended Herbert Von Sample's session earlier today, you heard both of them talking about operating at scale. Uh, and Herbert in particular, moving away from this idea of a repository-centric view of the world to a web-centric view. So not that you have some content, you put it into a database or a repository and then you build some interface but rather that you treat and prepare the content in a way so that it can be accessed and used in lots of different uh, services, through lots of different services and applications, including ones that you may not even anticipate. So that's the story that we're in some sense going to try and convey. Uh, and infrastructure is typically thought of as technology, but it also includes humans, and that's very much the story we want to talk about is the people part uh, of this. So, very quickly, the archaeology of reading, uh, you can see the, the URL for the project website right there, is a project that's been funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for two years. We think of this as the first phase of uh, at least two phases of the project. The partners include Johns Hopkins University, the University College London, uh, and Princeton University. And each of them is bringing both uh, a scholarly and a technology uh, capacity to the project. The scholarly goal relates to understanding the history of reading practices, and Yap will be telling you more about that. Uh, and then I will be telling you a little bit about the technology goal of building the infrastructure and, and describing that in greater detail. But I do think it's important that Yap go first, because even while I think uh, the story of the infrastructure is particularly interesting, it's still done towards supporting scholarship, towards supporting teaching, research, learning. Uh, and, uh, and publications and so on. So I'll turn it over to Yap first, who will tell you about the scholarly parts, and then I'll come back. Right, so basically what we're doing in this project in a nutshell is we are developing a tool which consists of a viewer which contains the digitized images of 12 books annotated by Gabriel Harvey, as well as the digital transcriptions uh, of all of Harvey's annotations, which will be fully searchable. Well, to start with the corpus, the 12 books, um, and Gabriel Harvey himself. Uh, Gabriel Harvey was born around 1550. We don't know exactly uh, in what year. He was born in Saffron Walden, a small uh, market town close to uh, Cambridge. He did his BA and MA at the University of Cambridge at Christ uh, College. He finished his, his studies as a civic uh, lawyer, but his civic career really wasn't, wasn't uh, that important and luckily for us what he did do, he annotated many of his books. He had quite a large library, although we don't know exactly how many books he owned. Uh, to date we, have, uh, we know that around 200 of his books uh, have survived. And the 12 books that we chose for our corpus are um, books which deal with a, a variety of topics. Uh, probably the main book is Livy's History of Rome. 
Um, there are several books which deal with warfare and strategy, such as Fontana's Stratagems and Machiavelli's Art of War. Um, and then we have, interestingly, two copies of uh, Castellone's The Book of uh, the Courtier, uh, both in Italian and, and English language. So it will be interesting to see the differences in the way uh, in which he annotated those books. Uh, about the annotations themselves, as you can see, you have uh, two images there. He wrote loads and loads of marginal notes, not only in the margins of the page, but also um, in the uh, printed text. He underlined um, the, uh, the, the printed words in the printed text as well. He had a variety of marks which he employed, such as plus signs, equal signs, dashes, and slashes. And he also had, interestingly, a set of symbols, astrological symbols, which he used uh, to mark up pages uh, in the book and indeed uh, parts of the printed text. As you can see, if you look at the left image in the upper left corner, you see a circle with a dot in it, which is the, the, the sign of the sun, which represents a king or kingship. Another symbol, a symbol which he frequently used was the Mars symbol, which denotes war and warfare. Our project is very much the fruit, really, of quite a recent historiog uh, historiographical development, which can be summarized as a movement away from the reader towards the history of reading. So normally, marginal notes were used to probe into the mind of the reader, to unearth the innermost feelings uh, of the reader and, and of the annotator. However, in 1990, uh, Lisa Jardine and Tony Grafton published a seminal article, um, Studies for Action, how um, Gabriel Harvey read his Livy. In this article, they argued that Harvey did not read uh, Livy just for the sake of reading, but his reading had a really practical purpose for it. They showed that Harvey, in the capacity of a professional reader, read, uh, read the book together with uh, Philip Sidney in order to prepare Sidney for his uh, diplomatic missions on the continent. However, after the publication of this article, there have been many other of these kind of case studies, how X read his or her Y, but really a study which addressed the larger question of the history of reading and reading practices has not been produced. Interestingly, our project, although we in the first phase work with Harvey and the second phase with John Dee, so with known identifiable annotators, the project is not about Harvey. We do not want to... Um, do this project in order to add to the biographical uh, record of Harvey himself. Rather, Harvey, as Lisa Jardine phrased it, is seen as an operator. He started reading and writing in one book, moved to another book in which he referred yet to other books. So how can we follow Harvey and how can we follow in his footstep and in his intellectual pathways? Harvey then is more seen as a neutral vehicle through which we can address the history of reading. Well, based on these developments, some scholarly goals were, um, were formulated. One thing we need to do is move away from just the marginal notes as the privileged, some sort of the highest, highest form of annotation towards um, an XML schema which we have developed, which can capture all the different forms of annotation. Interestingly, when we started doing this and when we started generating these transcriptions, it became clear that one of the things why a study of the history of reading has been so difficult is because of the size of the data. We have now generated all transcriptions and we have used more than 102,000 tags. Only the underlined tag, which captures the, the uh, underscored words in the printed text, contain more than 220,000 words alone. So the scholar really needs to have some tools in order to help him understand um, reading practices on, on this scale. Another thing we needed to do is, in order to discern patterns, we need to prov provide a way of examining these different forms of annotation in conjunction with one another. It's not enough just to do a simple string search, for instance, in these marginal notes, but we also have to relate the marginal notes to the printed text, for instance, looking for key concepts which appear in the printed text and in the marginal notes as well. Another important thing is to make it possible to follow Harvey through his books. As I mentioned, often in his marginal notes he referred to other books, but also in his books himself he referred to other pages in the book he was reading in. So we need to enable the user to follow Harvey through his books and to 
make um, these kind of links uh, possible. In order to do so, and in order to capture the annotations, we make use of XML. One of the advantages of XML, of course, is that it's flexible, so we could just, um, uh, formulate and design our own categories in which we can, could put uh, the data. And another benefit was that Cell had uh, experience in working with XML um, from pre previous pro uh, projects. When we started with this, we did a survey of the existing schemas, and of course the text encoding initiative, the TEI schema standard, is very well known. It has been rightly praised for its, its comprehensiveness, and it really is able to do what they want to do, namely generating electronic uh, digital edi ed editions of printed books. However, its comprehensiveness is at the same time also its liability. TEI is fairly top-heavy, and indeed, the, the manual of the latest version of TEI, TEI 5, amounts to several hundreds of pages. More important for us, though, TEI focuses on printed books, whereas we focus on annotated books, and objects which sit between manuscripts on the one hand and printed books on the other hand. TEI, therefore, is not really able to deal with annotate annotations, manuscript annotations in printed books very well. Um, some of the elements of TEI, they um, they show where in the printed books you can find annotations, but we want to capture much more information, such as the, uh, the people, the books, and the geographical locations Harvey's mentioning in his marginal notes. Therefore, we decided not to use TEI, but instead create our own bespoke schema. The development of the schema started in the Cell HQ in, in London, and you can see there's a whiteboard. My colleague Matt Simons and I we started uh, drafting a schema, but th from then on, the development of the schema was very much an iterative process. We sent the schema over to our colleagues at DRCC at Johns Hopkins, and we explained why we want to capture certain data and why we want to capture it in a certain way, and they commented on the schema and explained uh, their preferences to us as well. After several of these, these interesting conversations, um, we came up with, with a version of the schema, which was deemed ready, and from then onwards we started generating these transcriptions. Alongside the creation of this schema was the creation of a transcriber's manual. This manual, on the one hand, is some sort of a log which explains why certain decisions uh, regarding the schema were made, and also explains the concepts and the ideas that underpin the schema. And on the other side, the manual is indeed a manual for the transcribers, explaining the schema, explaining the way in which the text should be used, all in order to create a standardized data set. All of this means that it was not a client-provider relationship. It was not a bunch of over-enthusiastic scholars who cooked up some nice ideas and at some point went to the technology people and said, look, can you build us this? From the onset, it has always been a really collaborative effort uh, joining scholars, uh, uh, techies as we call them in the office, and librarians as well, in order to create a really robust foundation uh, on which the rest of the project uh, rests. Having said that, the development and the further process of developing is explained by Seed. Thank you, Jaap. Um, so, it, it, most of you probably don't know uh, that I'm actually an engineer by training, even though I've been working in the library for many years, and my advisor in graduate school had an interesting view of engineering. He used to call it a liberal art, and I asked him what he meant by that, and he said, engineering is about people, processes, and products, and the workflows that connect them. And if you only think about the technology or the math or the so on, you're missing the entire liberal arts aspect of engineering. And I think that this is the way we have approached this particular project. Uh, in many ways, people jump immediately to the product side of development uh, of these kinds of, of activities or projects. And I think that it wouldn't be at all unusual to basically take this kind of activity and say, give us some use cases, and then we will extract requirements, and then we will build an interface that sits on top of your repository or database. And I would say use cases are about translation of understanding. And what I think this kind of engineering approach is, is about shared understanding. So one of the stories I like to talk about is Lisa Jardine, we had these regular Skype phone conversations and she was participating in one of them and talking about 
her research and why she cares so much about these books and what she tries to learn. And I said, you know, I'm really sorry I have a meeting to go to in just a few minutes, but I'll listen for as long as I can. But I ended up listening to all of it. I listened to everything she said, and I was late to my meeting. And she apologized. She said, I'm really sorry. I know you had this meeting, and I've kept you for too long. And I said, please don't apologize. Please don't apologize for sharing your story. And please don't apologize for sharing with such passion, because that's ultimately what we're trying to capture here. So it really is this process of trust and understanding in a shared kind of manner. Yap showed you that whiteboard. I think if you're a technology person, I, I mean this in the most loving way. The best way to engage a technologist is write something within pointy brackets on a whiteboard. You've got us. If you're willing to sit down and go through that kind of process, then there's engagement, there's shared understanding. Let me give you one example. Harvey is an operator. So Yap gave you the scholarly reason for why they're comfortable with looking at Harvey in this first phase and why there are 12 books. One of the most interesting conversations that took place early on was, again, technologists and scholars in the room, raging debate about whether this would be enough number of books, whether we should go beyond Harvey. And I'm completely lost. There are words like postographical. I think that was the word. I don't even, to this day, I don't even know what that means. But I'm trying to keep up the conversation. And then after about an hour or so, I basically say, I have a naive question for you. Can you tell me, if you take these 12 books and you take Harvey as a reader, do you think you're going to capture the universe of symbols and annotations and underlines and so on? And they said, we probably will. And I said, then from a technology perspective, I'm done. That, that's what I need to know because you've defined the possible set of transcriptions, markups, uh, and so on that we will need. So this kind of understanding comes about when you have this people, processes, products, and the workflows that connect between them. So what happens at the end of this is typically you get these what I'll call public results. You get this digitized corpus of books. So we can now look uh, at those images. We have physical images, we, we have transcriptions, and so on. We have the markup of all the physical annotations that you see in this book. We have these two viewers that are IIIF compliant. Uh, again, if you heard Cliff's comments earlier, there's something called the International Image Interoperability Framework, or IIIF, that is about interoperability of sharing and accessing images. Uh, so it basically manifests itself in two APIs. One is an image API that allows you to deploy an image server, and the other is a presentation API that allows you to actually show these images as a set of canvases and so on. We have a layered infrastructure that supports this. At the bottom of that layer is the storage. This is where the bits actually reside. On top of that is an archive layer. And that layer is where the validation of the content, the management of the content, the integrity checking of the content takes place. It's at this third layer where these APIs are implemented. So we have this IIIF image API and presentation API implemented in a generic enough way that we ought to be able to swap out image servers, we ought to be able to swap out uh, the viewers themselves. And then the very top layer is the website, that bookwheel.org, where you will go and see the content and then ultimately see these viewers. So these are the kinds of things you typically see. Now, the use cases, as Yap mentioned, we, we did develop uh, a set of use cases, but we didn't do it at the very beginning of the project. We, we did it roughly six months into the project because we needed to build that kind of shared understanding and that shared capacity to, to work with each other. And then the use cases were developed at that stage. And they built upon use cases that we had from a previous project called the Roman de la Rose Digital Library. So this is a set of digitized French medieval manuscripts that also have annotations. And we had a clear postdoc develop a set of use cases for that project that we shared with this project team and said, can you build from these? Can you adopt some of them? Can you modify them? And so on. So in some sense, we can't get both of those project teams together, but we can, again, share that understanding or translate that understanding between the use cases. And we did ask the scholars to do this, and they, they did in an incredible way. These are very rich, detailed use cases. It's not a couple of sentences. They actually follow a very specific template that we've used for a lot of our other software development activities, and they talk about preconditions and pathways and assumptions and so on. So this is a very serious time commitment on the part uh, of the scholars that we've been working with. Now, these are some of the results that you probably typically wouldn't see 
because they sit on the infrastructure side of, of, this, of this project. But they are equally important, and in some ways they're at the heart of why we think this project can, can be a, a model for others to think about. There is a data model that describes the content that we've produced, and a precursor to IIIF is something called Shared Canvas. In our view, we think Shared Canvas is very much the data model, and IIIF is a, is a protocol for implementing that data model. Now, why should you care about data models? So one of the things that you will think about with this repository-centric view is metadata, sharing of metadata, and I think that's really great and it's important, but it's a certain kind of interoperability. If you share your metadata, it's really more about discovery and searching and knowing something exists. But if I actually want to use your data, if I want to process it, run analytics against it and so on, metadata is probably not enough. I need to be able to look at your data model and compare it to mine and see if there are commonalities or bridges or places where we can make those connections. And so the W3C now has a working group on annotations and they have a draft data model. And one of the things we intend to do is compare our data model to theirs to see where there are commonalities, overlaps, or modifications that we will need to make. And I suspect by doing it at that level, we'll have a much better chance of being actually able to use the data from each other's products, projects, not just discover uh, that they exist. As Jaap mentioned, we have this XML schema uh, that was developed in this iterative process. In many ways, that is an expression of the collaboration between the scholars and the technologists. And it allowed us to create the RDF or express uh, a lot of these transcriptions and comments and so on in an RDF format, or linked data if you want to call it that, that is at the foundation of, of what we're trying to do. Now I'd mentioned this other project, the Ramon de la Rose uh, Digital Library. This was built some years ago. In fact, it started in the mid-90s. And we basically used shared canvas, that precursor to IIIF, to create uh, an interface for that particular project. The lead scholar for that effort and the postdoc that uh, I had talked about, Tamsin Rose Steele, and Steve Nichols being the medievalist, had said, we want to update this particular digital library as well. And we said, we can do that for you, but what we'd rather not do is build you a new interface. We'd rather update the content. So in essence, what we did is we made the ROSE data IIIF compliant. And there's another set of manuscripts that we have access to from someone called Christine de Pizan. And we've made that IIIF compliant. So now all of that content can be accessed by the same set of viewers for the same set of services. And we don't have to keep building new interfaces for all of these different kinds of content. So it's not about updating the front view, it's about updating the processing of the data that underlie it sort of in the back end, if you will. We have detailed statistics uh, about the work of this project. So if you're familiar with agile software development, there's this concept of velocity, how much produce you produce in any particular sprint or fixed period of time. While we didn't quite get quite that far, we are in fact looking at when did the scholars make a lot more progress? Where were their bottlenecks? What were some of the constraints? What were some of the things that worked really well? So in essence, in the future, when we work on more content or other teams start to work on similar content, we may be able to say to them, if you take this kind of approach, it will actually help you in terms of moving uh, down, down this path. And just recently, last week, we have a data release. So if you go to the website uh, and you go to the downloads page, you'll get information and then actually access to a bunch of data that we have produced. And these data are about the books themselves. They're about the kinds of symbols that we found, the frequency of those symbols, distribution of those symbols, all sorts of data about the content itself, things that we think are interesting, things that we have produced, spreadsheets and charts and so on, but you can use them. You can come along and produce your own views, put your own lenses uh, onto that data, and in fact, I, I would encourage you to do so. So let me come back to this Mars symbol uh, that Yap had mentioned earlier, and for me, this is a very clear-cut case of the difference between these two approaches that I'm, I'm describing. I think if we took that let's put the content somewhere and build an interface and work off use cases, we would have ended up with a website or a viewer where you could page through and see all the Mars symbols. And I think that's very helpful, and I think that's very useful, and I think an expert 
someone like Tony Grafton or Yap or so on would be able to take that and go into a classroom and say, here you go, I'm gonna scroll through and show you these pages with the Mars symbols and we can talk about what the possible implications may be. By taking the approach we did, what we will be able to do is generate a virtual book of all the pages with Mars symbols. So it will grab from different books and reassemble them into a virtual book that is just the Mar symbol. Will that be useful? I don't know. But the question is we can do it and we have experts who can look at that and start to say, look, Harvey seemed to use the Mar symbol always in this case, or he never used it in that case, or it's around this particular word. Those are the kinds of interesting questions that we didn't think about at the beginning of the project. We didn't build use cases around those, but we can ask them now because of this approach that we've taken. I think the key is to be able to take the data that you're given, deconstruct it, and reconstruct it in interesting ways. And I'd like to propose a new metric for success of these projects that we work on. That is that somebody comes along and uses your data in an unanticipated way without asking you for it. There doesn't need to be this pairwise conversation about, yeah, yeah, this is the really particular way we did this, or we built a shim or a connector that allows this to work with your application or so on. It needs to be actionable enough that they can point to it and whatever machine mechanism they're using can access the data. And it would be fantastic if they did so in ways we didn't think about because that to me would prove that they've actually come up with new ways of using the data in ways that, you know, even though we have assembled a tremendous scholarly team, we know there are other people who have interesting ideas. We know undergrads may want to try different things and so on. And the key is that the, the data are in that kind of format and they're available for this kind of processing. So with that, I will just uh, end with a few acknowledgements. We, of course, are very grateful to the Mellon Foundation for their generous support. Each of our institutions has actually put forward significant support as well. Uh, there's a page on the website about the archeologists themselves, um, so you can see all the people involved, including uh, our advisory board, and we have plenty of time for comments or questions, and I'm sure Yap and I would be happy to hear your feedback. Thank you.